looked at it is in fact since beginning this virus is uh, changing the definitions of the life and definitions of the work definitions of the job roles and business models whenever this situation come as a challenge it's the true business leaders they all take the responsibility to face this challenge and take these challenges as an opportunities every time we see these kind of challenges and we are coming out with the solutions yesterday we were, we were talking to narendra and he was saying that rather than uh, maybe challenges we have to talk about uh, what are the opportunities that we can see there not every industry get uh, advantage of this situation like pharma pharma we are actually yes we have an advantage it comes in essential services and government is allowing us to go to offices and go to uh, plants but still we have challenges we will also discuss about those challenges what i found majorly is that uh, in these what i was uh, continuously observing as a trainer on a uh, various business models how they have changed that today only i read the news that spice jet uh, started its uh, uh, air ambulance business actively now air ambulance will be served by this uh, spice jet also e-commerce food delivery businesses what they thought is that all the restaurants will be closed now our delivery will happen so successfully but overnight because of one delivery boy the entire business model again changed these kind of dynamic situations challenges are there in various business sectors maybe we will have to discuss in deep what are those challenges industry wise and what are the opportunities we see and what are those barriers that we see and how do we come out that's what is my take the initial take that and share sure so how do we take this conversation forward so i was i was more so thinking we will reflect on what is it that we are seeing around us changing possibly uh, so i had some thoughts probably i would reflect on that on uh, what are some of those i think i have made a note of about five shifts in 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 the world around us that i'm seeing today elaborate so we we probably um, Start contributing to that, and then we'll talk about how we're reacting to some of the changes and what we should keep in mind as as industry practitioners in this job. So, I, I in my note, I, I think about five different shifts that I see. Um, the first is what we just said: the shift in the views, right? Uh, home is a new office. Um, I don't think real estate is is going to be any more uh, a requirement for organizations to operate today. Uh, so that that For me, is a big shift that I I really see, and what is being defined as essential commodities for life uh, has also been changed. If you said pharma is it is an essential commodity and will continue to be, but some of the things that we considered as essential, I have not touched my car in the last I don't know for how long. There is a different theory which talks about the fact that the social distancing will boost the Boost the uh, the automobile industry as well, and that's another hard process that goes in there. I think uh, services like agriculture and manufacturing is probably gaining its lost glory today because that that is the most wanted. Even if you are in the house, outside the house, you need to eat. Doctors and social workers are gaining uh, a new momentum. So I, I believe there is a big shift in the way uh, we look at uh, the way we work, the way we operate at this point in time. Another shift that I see is uh, the way we look at investments and budgets. Right, so organizations have come to terms that headcount is no longer a luxury. And I run a huge, you know, uh, shared services uh, technology shared services organization with multiple people working. And now today we have started challenging the aspect of what does headcount mean to you and what is acceptable headcount utilizations. Uh, Uh, you know, your capacity, capabilities have started becoming bigger. I think uh, many organizations have started looking at investments and reprioritization. We have started speaking on where we should be investing. Should we be investing in collaboration tools? Should we be investing in uh, you know digital solutions and learning, etc. The biggest shift that we also see is on the shift on leadership today. I think. Uh, 
leadership is more becoming focused around empathy and trust. Um, organizations and leaders cannot survive in today's environment unless you show uh, compassion to your workforce. So it has become a mandatory aspect to connect with new team members. I believe leaders are doing it a lot more on virtual platforms than they would have done on, 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 on physical environments in the past. I think the value of EQ is, is today more than IQ. Organizations have started to realize that, that that's how uh, it, it, it operates. Um, I think ethics is more valuable. Organizations, the people in organization expect the business and the leadership to be, to be honest and tell them what the consequences are, what measures are being, uh, are being taken. And where, uh, you know, uh, what also um, becomes extremely critical is uh, organizations are dry, driven to be more performance driven and meritocracy driven today. I think the workforce today has started to appreciate leaders and organizations which are willing to call out uh, uh, what, what the, the compromises we are making and encouraging, rewarding excellence. Uh, that's that's pretty much become uh, a requirement. Learning world is also changing. I think we are a bunch of learning professionals today. Uh, organizations which reluctantly kept saying digital, digital, and focused a lot more on one-to-one on, on -one training are changing the ways. A facilitator is, is going to become a, a luxury world in the future. Uh, platforms would pave way, knowledge management systems to pave way to to the so-called trainers and facilitators of the future. Um, upskilling and reskilling is becoming a, a huge factor for organizations today. You've got to go to your people, assess your people for their competence. Um, and automation is the future. I think organizations uh, are shifting into the new ways of working, bringing more automation opportunities. So what I really see is all of this has been ongoing conversations around us for the last decade or so, and we all felt and kept saying to ourselves that it is tomorrow. 2020 was never, you years earlier when the world environmental forum met and, and they spoke about 2020 is a break even year for the world. Nobody really meant what they said, but it just happened. So I think uh, it has become a fast track momentum of change. A lot of the things, a lot of the shifts that we're talking about is happening happening right now. And uh, I, I honestly feel the world that we will walk back into a few weeks from now is not the one that we walked away from a few weeks earlier. So that's, that's something which we cannot sort of uh, discount. Uh, over to you, Ram, what, what do you think about these changes? What are your reflections? What is in, in your experience? Ram, I think you have to unmute your mic. All right. I did. Yeah. See, personally, in my working style, our working uh, pattern did not shift too much because we're going to office, we are alone. I found a lot of shift, in fact, uh, though government is allowing or healthcare is very important to run. When we bring employees, Social distance at workplace is a biggest challenge. There's a big shift for HR to redefine how they work and what is the shift system, what should be the payments. And uh, when people are not able to come due to public transportation unavailability, what should we do? There's a major shift for, in fact, I found a lot of leaders, they used to always ask manpower, we require people all the time. Please recruit, send people in all. We need to train them, send them as uh, as soon as we finish training for them. Certification is done and immediately they used to go to workplace. Today, leaders started learning how to get things done with a less manpower, how to train them. And now the shift is that you need not go to a four-wall classroom and now you can sit before the computer and you can learn. And in fact, this digitized learning is a helping us to focus more on the screen and content will also be focused. 
and people were as you rightly said narendra and people were reluctantly accepting this digital learning and e learning platforms and all today people are inquiring for that you know all the share prices of these uh, virtual learning companies have gone up and a lot of people are coming into the market the new opportunities we have seen what i found is that there are in you know, a learning professionals there are some barriers i found the barriers to shift in this covid 19 scenario people need to come out of these barriers those barriers what i found is on one mental barriers physical and structural barriers also there are technical barriers there because uh, as a pharma industry this is not that tech savvy particularly in a learning front and our technology i mean because of the data security and all we will not allow the systems for everyone to access remotely and work from home is a challenge and sometimes organizations feel they don't mind even the department doesn't function or gets delayed but we cannot give the system home so this has been uh, a big challenge for hr they do not know how to get things done from home and uh, when you allow people to come by the bus organized by the organization and you, you will organize the transportation and they come here while transporting the manpower from different parts of the city to the plant and maintaining that social distance and physical distance in the bus it's also it's again it's a challenge and you are taking all the cares and when the first time people have learned all hr need to organize people to check the temperature of every employee before just you walk in because this one damage and one mistake may lead to a big mishap so these shifts and challenges are parallelly happening there and particularly at the learning front probably once we shift our discussion to the learning area that definitely i can share couple of challenges and also what we are looking at the temporary solutions what we think are the solutions is that which uh, helps us to come out of the current problems it may not be the end of the road but still we are exploring trial and error method we are trying out but I, what i found is that this is the right time for every role to redefine never expect that you will have the same kind of even it companies are not comfortable if their employees are continuously working from home now the organizations are the industries like pharma which cannot perform from home in fact you cannot ask employees work from home they will have to come to office at the workplace in the plant and they have to produce because health care is the need of the world and these are all my first sharings what i observed and i am experiencing around me also i i was just talking to a police inspector he stopped me then i have to show my id card and say that i am i am a healthcare professional i am going to the plant then they said that sir our department is also redefining our roles now all these days we were working for something else today now we are we are tracking and checking all the people those who are commuting to their offices and for silly reasons also people go and now employee has to work for the revenues of the organization also work for the country and you have a basic responsibility as indian citizen you need to balance that's the biggest challenge so let's just uh, maybe these challenges can be discussed further in our forum thanks yes, ram i think uh, thanks ram i think the last sentence is very powerful that uh, we have a responsibility towards our country and i think that's the reason today that uh, india is a little much little more safer than the rest of the countries and today the entire world is looking at india and i think uh, you know we are accountable for it so uh, thank you for bringing it up um i like to share about uh, a little about my organization we are a consulting organization it's an mnc uh, we have a global presence uh, in about 140 countries with uh, more than 120000 employees all over the world uh, and uh, uh, we we are into um uh, what do i say we are into 
breaking open products and checking whether they are meeting the compliance that they have uh, committed to or whether they are safe or whether they are meeting the quality standard. So we, we cater to about close to 1 billion products all over the world. So everything in your office premises or in your home that you will see from your laptops to your building material to your clothes to, to electrical fittings, everything would have been tested and verified by UL Underwriters Laboratories. Having said that, um, our entire business is based on two things. One, uh, we have laboratories. We have close to 350 labs all over the world where we you know, break open these toys. And uh, second, we, we are consultants. We help people build their businesses, become more profitable. So we are all the time sitting in front of our clients. So our world is completely crashed with this COVID. All our labs, the first one to get hit was Italy. Uh, they, in Italy, we have close to about six labs. And today, all our 350 labs are closed for operations. Uh, none of our sales and marketing team is in, sitting in front of a client and talking. But if I say business is on, yes, it is on. Uh, are we interacting with our clients? Yes, we are interacting. We are communicating. We are collaborating. In fact, you will not believe it. Just this morning, uh, we had a town hall and I was sharing with the, the LND team also. We uh, met our target plus 10 percent. So one, of course, we had backfill orders to fill and, you know, um, uh, but people are hopeful that we will open shop and we'll open our labs and they are ordering well in advance. So uh, we're, 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 you know, we're doing well, we're doing good. I would like to mention here some of the things that our leadership took care of. One, there are no layoffs, very clear, no layoffs. Second, uh, on a daily basis, uh, we are sending out messages um, on safety, on, uh, again, we have created uh, COVID-19 response teams so that in case any of our employees are infected or affected or family members are infected, there is a response team to take care of them. Insurance has increased. Yes, of course, we have uh, pulled back on our, you know, promotions and, uh, you know, bonuses and all that. That's, that's fine. But uh, I think like Narayan mentioned, the leadership has become so close to us. You know, they personally call us. Uh, we have weekly meetings every two, three days. Our manager will call us up and uh, the touch points have increased. Um, one of the outstanding things that is coming out and these are lessons to learn from organizations. I mean, you know, uh, how many Indian organizations are doing this is something that we really need to understand. Um, one of the things that really come, came out was, you know, checking on our well-being checking on our family, having fun oriented meetings. So every Friday we have pizza meeting, your most favorite beverage meeting. We have Antakshri and uh, you know, what have you achieved apart from your work? Uh, so somebody is baking cake, somebody is building furniture, somebody is singing songs, somebody is learning Sanskrit, so, you know? So they are checking on us that what, you know, what else are you doing to keep yourself engaged? So well-being, so safety, well-being, keeping yourself engaged as far as your own personal time is concerned. And uh, of course, learning has really increased a lot, like uh, Nareen mentioned again, you know, upskilling, reskilling. So, you know, on a daily basis, I mean, on a weekly basis, we are allocated uh, almost close to 10 to 15 programs that we need to go through on a weekly basis. So um, I think, you know, they quickly, they quickly took stock and uh, stood up and rose to the occasion. So there are a lot of thoughts that I'm leaving and you know, maybe we'll pick up, uh, you know, and we'll see how this can benefit the LND professionals who are freelancers and uh, who are on their own. Um, uh, they do not have permanent jobs, they have permanent income, but uh, you know, these are some points that I'm sure, you know, we can reconnect to a little later on in the conversation. But this is what, uh, you know, we are experiencing. I thought I'll share it with all of you. 
Over to you, Naren. Uh, shall we move to uh, challenges or opportunities? I leave it to you. Or do you have something in mind? So I would like to listen to Narendran. Maybe uh, due to this shift, what is the impact on your profession? Also, what is the outcome? What is the performance of the organization? Uh, at, by, uh, at large, do you feel that performance improved? People say that, yes, sometimes organizations work for five days. Performance improved a lot. People are working from home. They are doing very well because they're happy. The work-life balance is maintained. All these things are all happening. How, how do you experience them? Your mic is off. Sorry, sorry. I think I realized I didn't realize that I was muted. Okay. So I think uh, there are traditional methodologies of measuring performance that uh, organizations, I represent uh, a combination of banking and technology. I, I do technology for a bank, so it's a combination of both. The traditional way of, of looking performance, uh, performance in the form of productivity, performance in the form of you know, uh, code quality or quality of applications and systems that you create for your customers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I think we can definitely say that there has been um, ups and downs in, on, on account of, of that particular aspect, right? Uh, for example, call center as a business has had some impact uh, purely because it is practically impossible to, to shift 100% of the operations onto. What has really worked is, uh, understanding and acknowledging a potential impact on the normal ways of working and shifting over to other ways of reaching out to customers. So our chat engines have become more active. Our, uh, you know, our other avenues of email conversations, all of that has become more active. I mean, you are dealing with millions of retail customers across the globe, that becomes extremely critical. Uh, at the same time, I would also want to talk about uh, performance of an organization on account of the goodwill, right? I and mean, the way you have kept your service levels um, or your service standards up, and the way you have continued to reach out to your customers, continue not just to monitor your own employees and your own business, but also the well being of your customers. What you go out and say, so Standard Chartered uh, did come out and announce. Uh, a one billion package for small emerging industries during this crisis and said how we're going to be doing sustainable finance solutions for some of these organizations and that sort of reflects on you know, how you look at it. we also came up with a stimulus package of over 50 million us on on, on making things better and i, I like what Venita mentioned uh, your narrative and articulations that you have uh, around what you're going to be doing for your people, no loss of uh, income, no redundancies or job losses. Those also result in goodwill, performance around goodwill for an organization. And that is not something that we measure That's on a frequent basis. And uh, that, I think, has become a lot more important. And uh, you would see higher degrees of motivation. You would see higher degrees of, uh, of, of you know, contributions. Uh, Shift in the no, mindset. I wanna, absolutely. And I, I, I see on an average about 10 stories a week on how a couple of our colleagues have gone out of our ways and influenced the customer's life. And that for me is performance of an organization. And that has been ex exponential in the last uh, couple of weeks. And on the other end, we also want to discourage uh, this sort of, uh, you know, careless, uh, outlook towards productivity and towards contributions, right? We strongly go back to our employees and tell them that they should take their leaves. They should not cancel their leaves. They should only work X number of hours in the day. And we see people logged into systems for many hours. We go back and proactively reach out to them because what we don't want to do is we don't want people to, to burn out, people to feel the fatigue, people because it's, it's quite possible when you're sitting in front of a computer uh, through the day, right? And for us, we also want to discourage certain performance measures when it starts shooting up because it has a, a counter impact or an adverse impact on the long-term benefit of 
for employees. So I think uh, it's too early to say uh, how the balance sheets would be, because we know the balance sheets would look different. Uh, because uh, many of the economies, China is, 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 is undoubtedly, I would say, the largest economy, not the US, but China is the largest economy. Hong Kong is a big economy. And these are some of the countries which have been deeply impacted because of, uh, of, of the virus. And there is no shying away from accepting the fact that it will have an impact on your, your balance sheets. But if you are uh, human uh, you know, index or if you are uh, you know, your, your uh, goodwill sheet is protected as an organization. If you have positive strides and more green marks on on that sort of a, of a scorecard, I think that's that's better performance for an organization, and that's something that we believe in. So we we've, we've done surveys, a couple of them to understand how our people feel. We're not sort of um, backtracking our usual engagement surveys. We are doing all of that to give an opportunity for our people to say. And that for us is performance. That's a beautiful definition, Narendra. And really, the performance at the emotional level, you need not measure every performance by numbers, but the big cultural shift will also be a biggest performance shift. And probably in days to come, it will be converted into numbers too. In fact, when I talk about our training shifts, what I found, Vanita, you know very well, all TED Talks are also becoming now webinars. You know very well, TED Talks are very popular. The group of people will be sitting and there's a closed room all around the world. These are happening and I've seen a couple of TED Talks uh, which are on the, on the screens happening and somebody's anchoring that shows. And also I found a lot of global universities are offering courses. See, I'm just sharing these, these shifts for, as you rightly mentioned, there are many uh, freelance trainers are there. They have, there are uh, entrepreneurs in the training business. Training professionals are there. If you observe these global universities, they're offering courses and certificates online. And you are getting that content sitting at home. It's a great opportunity. But to, to explore this opportunity, to utilize in right time, People have got some mental barriers that I found when I spoke to a couple of external vendors. These mental barriers are there. They are very comfortable only in the classroom when they are interacting with the students one-on-one -on -one because that emotional exchange predominantly satisfies the trainers. Then trainer feel that AC is training now. These are all uh, mental barriers. Probably they think that this is not done. I will not be happy and you cannot finish a session in one hour's time. All those things are the barriers. As long as you carry these barriers and you don't even try to get the business in fact from the vendor, you will not, you cannot convince people that training can happen this way also. And I have seen, uh, there are many people predominantly, they are very good at delivering a session, developing a content, but technically, technical literacy is very low. Technologically identifying the e-learning platforms and various learning avenues and what are those uh, 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 tools available to reach participants. These are all people need to literate. These are all technical barriers people need to operate. Sometimes, you know, you do not know. You know how to log in and interact with the people. You do not know. Uh, you have to unmute and mute and open camera. And also you can share the screen and you can also uh, watch the chatting. These areas are very, very important to effectively interact with the participants. So people have got some technical barriers people need to come out. And what are those other platforms available rather than very popularly known as Teams and Zoom? And there are many creative platforms which where you can innovatively present your content. And there are structural barriers also. Now I feel strongly uh, people, those who are comfortable only in the classroom, they'll have to make their drawing room as a training hall. And you will have to have a fair idea about what are all the equipment like a camera and your cables and your internet and your data, all those things you need to get the uh, knowledge. That literacy is very much required for you to identify the new uh, customers, identify your learners, and you can reach. So in these shapes, I found in the training, these are the barriers majorly I found. If you just come out of these barriers, 
and if you if you are open and if you redefine your role redefine as a trainer probably uh, opportunities will appear in front of you what do you say vanu yeah i completely agree with you and narain both um, i'd like to touch base a little on performance before i go into training um the way our organization is measuring performance is not based on uh, numbers at this point of time i mean they did that in the first two weeks and of course we also have a bcp you know in place that uh, uh, in the next four weeks in the next uh, six weeks how the business is going to be performing of course we uh, once we got that done and out of the way uh, the way we started measuring our performance is uh, how much of volunteering time are you spending they want us to volunteer how much of learning time are you spending so they started measuring our performance based on the time that we are spending and like narain said uh, they don't want us to be in front of a, in front of the screen 8 hours of the day they don't want it so they're saying 4 hours versus 4 hours if you can spend 4 hours of constructive time in front of this screen 4 hours we would like you to uh, uh, do some volunteering we would like you to spend with, with your family you do something which will build one more different skill apart from your professional skill so this is how they are measuring our time and every friday um, our entire you know review system with our global managers is based on this um secondly i want to mention here on technology that you were mentioning um uh, they were it partners who came and uh, started working with us and uh, checking with us that okay how what is your backup how are you planning your backup what is your storage available how is your bandwidth okay can you move uh, you know can you buy some more we'll pay for it uh, um you know how are you ensuring that when the power is lost you have a vps so they start enabling especially people managers uh, they did this for on not all the employees but especially people managers they started in enabling our technological structure so that it doesn't become a barrier when we communicate with our teams so uh, i i think that was super support that was given to all of us and i think as uh, professionals or as lnd professionals who are freelancing it's a good idea like you mentioned uh, uh, you know to convert one of your rooms into a training environment to ensure that you have your technology in place um i i had to chat I, i'm part of a healers group so i you know we we had to do a con call and i couldn't use zoom i couldn't use um ms teams and you know uh, skype was also you know giving me a problem you won't believe it when we started doing r and d uh, and like one of you mentioned that we we found there were eight or nine different chat rooms or you know uh, video enabled facilities or applications available for us to uh, communicate so how many of us are doing this kind of r and d and trying to find out how to connect with the people that we need to be staying in touch with um and uh, we successfully now you know we've been having our weekly calls and uh, we are using uh, house party sometimes we use zoom and sometimes we use google duo you know whatever works at that point of time depending on the number of people and uh, we are getting away with it very well so i think you know getting your technology structure in place your you know overcoming that barrier uh, creating an environment for you to also be encouraged and enthusiastic uh, and motivated to you know uh, work in that environment you know ensure that your uh, one of your living rooms is converted into a training environment because if you're missing a classroom then you need to make one for yourself now this virtual world is here to stay unfortunately fortunately you know business is going to change and the way people uh, you know interact is going to change so i think uh, this was uh, you know my personal learning in the last 4 or 5 weeks so over to you if you'd like to narin taking it yeah i think uh, if, if we can spend some time really to talk about uh, what is in it for an hr professional what sort of what sort of changes should an hr professional or a learning professional make in in their overall personality or overall outlook towards towards the future of work i think we we probably should spend a little bit of more time on that i think um, 
my initial reflections on i have often found learning to be a very specialist function or to be perceived to be a very specialist function people specialize in various aspects of learning there are a lot of so called trainers that exist and i i'd like to believe uh, 30 32 people on this conversation today it's a mix of what we call as process technology uh, finance trainers and a bit of a broader spectrum of behavior or culture trainers as well i think it's important as learning professional that we break those boundaries because um, there is an external outlook that is warranted at this point in time you can't limit and i just spoke about a, a bit about upskilling and and reskilling because we have a responsibility and accountability towards our business to understand what is the future where is the future so how do i build and bring in those skills and competencies in my workforce to to facilitate that future for example if you are if you are a technology trainer or a technology facilitator it is important for you to understand what changes would a scenario like this bring into the programming languages or agile methodologies or the way scrum is understood today because if you talk about agile teams and bringing teams together in the same premises uh, product owners and scrum masters and it is not going to happen anymore because the physical space is in the team so if you are an agile trainer who is preaching if i would use the word on how agile methodology should work it's time for you to start thinking broadly it's for, it's time for you to bring in that external perspective and say how is the current scenario how is virtual working how is remote working going to change agile construct and how do i identify those skills and competencies required in the so called technologists to to be able to adapt to that future work environment i think it, it has become extremely important for us as hr professionals learning professionals to have a deeper external outlook a deeper futuristic outlook and anticipate the future and help you know and and, and prepare our business to the changes that comes ahead of us so one of the big changes that i see happening in the hr professionals and learning professionals in the future outlook it is anticipating the future skills future requirements and being able to create solutions now what do you think what what are some of the things that you sort of come across in as a change for hr and learning profession see i take a cue narendran from you is one uh, is a uh, hr role and also of uh, the, the future business also from uh, vanita i take that r and d see uh, learning professionals can do lot of r&d and they can customize the solution sometimes you can educate your clients you do r&d you understand what are the various ways that you can reach the learners in fact in my experience that we are now conducting regular basis a uh, leadership webinars one hour webinar you will be surprised people met on the net those who do not know each other for the last 5 years they started interacting and the biggest uh, opportunity that i found is that public speaking and presentation skills can be it has got a great opportunity because most of the times when participants come for this kind of training programs they feel shy they are reluctant to come onto the dais give a presentation and appear before the group today perfectly adult learning methodology can be practiced here and people are alone they are with the system they are safe and they can present it and they can see the feedback they can alter their their presentation and all these are opportunities that people can see that and r and d and opportunities both if they see and you can customize or you can design new solutions to the client and see how people can think in a very new way Uh, this is what i think in fact the, the little work has to be done by professionals first rather than just talking about a change because everything is changing tell me when others even your client is also feeling that i know that change i am also experiencing how do you go with a customized solution so now learning professionals should be the solution providers rather than talking about a routine connecting on the web uh, webinars to visual platforms 
thanks Ram. Um, I'll share two experiences uh, that we I have gone through in the last uh, four or five weeks. One is uh, I got nominated by my global manager, uh, you know, uh, to attend a time management program. And I'm like, oh my God, this is something that I had done in uh, like 20, 25 years back and I have trained people on it. And what is this all out of the blue? So it was a 90 minute session. And uh, the girl who was taking the session is half my age, you know. So I switched off, you know, automatically I switched off. But then in the eighth minute after the session started, in the eighth minute, she and we were just five of us in the room. OK, uh, she was the sixth person and we were five in the audience. And in the eighth minute, she had a question for all of us. So I had to switch on and I had to answer and respond to the question. And uh, within 15 minutes, I realized that every seventh or eighth minute, she's got a question for us. And then I said, OK, I have to keep this mindset of mine on. Otherwise, I'm not going to finish the 90 minutes uh, easily. You will not believe it. Uh, of course, the content was pretty fresh and she herself had invested a lot of time, uh, you know, almost close to I understand from her. She spent almost four or five days in building that 90 minute content and she said whatever I had existingly, I just dumped it. I just dumped it and reworked on the way we manage our times, keeping the new scenario in mind. Um, the way she engaged the audience was that every eighth seventh or eighth minute she had an interactive question and we had to respond. We had homework given. We had to respond to that. We, we had a small presentation uh, time that was allocated to us for you know 60 seconds. We had to you know speak on something and we had to respond to that. She kept us on our toes for 90 minutes. I thoroughly enjoyed myself and I knew now webinars or let's say you know online learning sessions or these interactive sessions are going to see a huge botox or let's say a facelift, huge facelift. All that we need to do is become creative. Whatever whatever material we have, we should just dump it and rethink on our strategies. So this is one thing that I experienced. Uh, this is something that I personally received. And since we are consultants, uh, you know, uh, we have to be uh, you know in touch with our clients and I am part of the operations team, so we have close to almost 300 projects that are you know, all the time floating around. So um, uh, we saw some matured clients of us. So we made a list of our matured clients. We made a list of clients who are, you know, where the project is still ongoing and we don't have to really worry about it. We, uh, we made a list of new clients, new babies, uh, you know, on the shop floor. So we knew, you know, a little bit of handholding and we'll be through. But the matured clients who are going to wean off we're going to wean off very slowly and COVID is only going to help them wean off. Those clients, we got in touch with them and we said, you know, you and I have shared a success story. So why don't we make up, build a case study of it and put it up on your website and my website? And uh, the I was able to connect with about 12 matured clients and three of them said yes, and which is fair enough. You know, it gives me work to do gives me a lot of time and uh, we started working with them and uh, scripting our case studies, case, uh, scripting our success stories. I think most important my takeaway is I got the client to be engaged with me. I got the client to keep interacting with me so that whenever this COVID thing gets over, you know, and they have new business for me, they are going to pick up the phone and say, you know, UL is what we want to work with. So I think that's that was a huge learning I, and I didn't come up with this idea. I mean, it was, you know, generally brainstormed during a session like this and uh, it worked. It worked wonderfully well. So I thought I'd share this with you. I mean, I'm going to take a bit of cues in terms of uh, a statement uh, which I came across and I used to the thing when we had called introduce yesterday as well. I think this is uh, Somebody asked me a question, uh, what solutions can you offer in response to COVID? And I said none, because uh, I think for most of us, this is probably the first time we have ever sort of encountered a pandemic. So I cannot, in my 19, 20 years of work experience, I cannot dig back into my past experiences and offer a solution. So one of the things that we as learning and HR professionals need to do in the current circumstances is to leverage diversity. 
diversity of thinking, diversity of thoughts. And most solutions that on, on managing a crisis such as this uh, has come up from a wider set of people, right? I have people about 50, 60 who have probably done, seen an economic crisis, a youngster in, in, in a Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, as we call it today, who's, who's coming up with a set of crazy ideas, which, which might sound crazy, but often works. And a set of mature professionals, SMEs who understand. So I think what is our, what is our responsibility as human resources and learning professionals is to harness that diversity, understand where that diversity exists across the organization, put them together and find solutions to our customers. So I'm, I'm fairly positive the ideas that you had uh, would have come in from one of your, probably Monica, one of your younger uh, colleagues who would have probably given you this idea. And then when you start taking a decision which is absolutely crazy and could backfire as a senior seasoned expert in your organization can say, I don't think this is going to work for these people. We as HR professionals today need to be a lot more attentive, do a lot more listening, be a lot more welcoming of ideas, not sort of block ideas and conversations because you don't have the patience. Time is not your virtue. You're trying to accomplish a lot more. So I have realized that listening has become a lot more pertinent as a competence for us as HR professionals today. And accepting diversity has become a lot more important for us. Another element which I've observed in, in, in learning professionals, I have a very good friend of mine who's a senior consultant, learning consultant with uh, one of the petroleum companies, and she was doing a session a couple of days earlier on virtual platform on power dressing, if I'm not mistaken. And I know her and I know her idiosyncrasies and the way her body language uh, works. I think it's a lot more limiting for professionals like us to, to fit into a 11 inches, 14 inches, 15 inches screen and, and deliver, right? I think it's a struggle. And I was watching her video and I, I knew she was really, really struggling uh, to, to fit herself into that smaller screen. I think it also challenges our, our, our postures, our, our, uh, you know, our movements and how we run sessions and facilitate sessions today. I think it's important that I, I, and she and I were having a conversation and she told me a great, she said, I'm, I'm sitting and doing a lot more virtual conversations today. She asks her husband or her daughter to log into a system and she practices. I think I, I would, I, I sort of like the idea. I think it's also important for us to practice remote facilitation, remote training programs. And I like your idea of converting one of your rooms into a virtual classroom or a mock classroom and do those sessions. So I think some of these are another sort of interesting changes that we should bring in, into our into our lives. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, let's... Yeah, let's... yeah I, I think it's wonderful. So we are one hour down and we have another uh, 60 minutes to go. So do you want to take questions or do you have something else to contribute, uh, something that uh, you would like to really emphasize on? Uh, otherwise, we can start taking questions. Hey, Vanita, I just wanted to have a conversation on this. Good that we are talking about the shifts, changes, and how people started using all the web platforms and interacting people virtually. Over a period of time, if you see, I also sense this because we can't ignore this. Uh, people are really fed up with that. When I am asking, there's a webinar. People said, yeah, already I have attended three webinars today. Though they are one hour, one hour, one hour, somehow people are mentally, they are not really getting adjusted with this. Maybe in other words, what Narendran was also saying that in a small frame, fitting and talking to them, because this demands mindfulness. This demands the continuous focus and sustainable interaction. And this is the biggest challenge for people, and particularly for the generation, those who cannot concentrate for a longer time, and it demands mindfulness. So now, is there any other way we need to just look into that? Just uh, what we, what the major difference that you find is the transportation. You are meeting and you are talking to people without going there, without personally meeting. Other than that, do you have any advantage that very innovatively you can present? Can you engage them? 
can you also interact with them and check that they will participate very actively these kind of tools or innovative methods need to be identified before people feel that everybody started speaking about webinars and i know that this is zoom platform and uh, teams platform whatever they are not so familiar it is they are they are so familiar they are not so interested to come on and hang on to these platform because they are going to be again so common every day so how do we in fact address this what are all the various methods to hang on so that people won't feel that they are getting bored with the system so i'm so happy to realize that we moved from covid to the challenges of webinars now <laughs> being in front of <laughs> so covid is anyway out of the way you know as family time we've stopped listening to covid news just fyi yeah, enough yeah. Of it. it's there that's it we, we have to just work around it now so this is interesting so again you know let me ask you do you want to take some questions or or uh, do you want to continue with uh, you know, chatting up i think Yeah, let's let's take some questions. I think it'll be otherwise it'll questions. it'll become it'll it's one hour of listening to us already. Yeah, the questions also. also may lead some discussions, so concomitantly uh, okay, right. they they go. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. so you have um, questions. Yeah. Yeah, Marini, are you? Uh, ask thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Narain, Ram, and Vanitha for the insight insightful conversation. and uh, we do have some uh, very thought provoking questions here i'll see it in the chat window so the first question is from pad so padma kumar would you like it to uh, like to ask yourself so that it's more uh, relevant and genuine or do you want me to read it from the chat window or uh, marni i think you can go ahead okay great all right so uh, the first question from her is uh, do the panelists that's the speaker see large monolith offices getting reorganized into small distributed offices due to the need for social distancing and drawing comfort from the work from home that we have become comfortable with now so what's your opinion uh, the question i guess can be taken by either of the speakers i think let me let me take that on because i just came out of a conversation on a big real estate we were spending about 26 million us on a on a property and we just said why I spoke about uh, reprioritizing investments. I don't think the workspace is in, as important anymore. Uh, it's the work. It's how you get the work done, which is. So I think TCS came out a couple of days earlier and said by 2025, 75 percent of their workforce will work from home. Uh, I think uh, Infi made a statement saying that they want to look at anything between 30 to 40 percent of their workforce. These are large employers. TCS employs over four and a half lakh people in in India and abroad. and they are the ones who are, have the monopoly of large and small offices if you get to a bangalore every third fourth building at once used to be one of these tech companies right so the the conversation in the future would be in terms of how to leverage anywhere working than remote working or than uh, you know tech centers or anything of that sort so uh i think uh, uh, how does the organizations react i believe one the moment we come out of covid every organization is going to look at their real estate requirements the real estate prices especially for commercial properties are going to slash substantially uh there's a lot of property that's going to go uh, and i think some of those will probably get converted i think some of those industries which didn't have access to some of these premium uh, you know centers and tech centers would probably have access to them at a much cheaper rate So my take is simple: uh, workplaces will become irrelevant. Work will become more relevant. Yeah. Now I'd like to just quickly add one line on it. So uh, uh, we were speaking about um, how we are going to kind of, you know, smooth entry as soon as the lockdown opens. So as an organization, we decided that the labs will operate first. and our offices uh, workmen will work continue to work from home till we are completely out of um, uh, this threat so only our labs will be operating so this itself shows a you know transition in uh, the way we are approaching this problem i uh, see uh, i just wanted to share what is our current practice in fact in padma kumar question what i see one keyword is the social distancing so what we did is that uh, 
we asked we, we uh, broke uh, our employees into three segments the one segment will work from home and the other two segments will choose whether to come morning shift or evening shift and in fact where the 20 people were working on one floor now only uh, six to seven people started working so social distance is maintained by giving them choices of the shifts this is what is the current practice padma kumar i think uh, that that will address your question right. yes it does sir. Um, thank you Yes, there is a continuation to Padma Kumar's question. I guess it's addressed to Nareen. Um, how would banking sector cope with a work from home uh, centric future? That's a continuation question. Is that right, Padma Kumar? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, banking. Uh, uh, banking is an interesting business, right? Banking uh, has uh, traditionally, when you know, I, I went to a bank for the first time with my father. I met the bank manager. When I went to the bank the last time in Singapore, I met with something like Siri or Alexa, a virtual relationship manager. Uh, so the way the banking, with or without COVID, uh, the way the banking looks today uh, and looks tomorrow is is going to be different. I remember when I was in Hyderabad when I started my career, walking into a bank every month to cut out a DD to pay for my education loan, uh, and today. I don't think I've gone to a branch for anything for that matter. Everything happens on my mobile device, so uh, that probably gives you the answer. It doesn't impact because banks would get onto your smart devices and your phones in the future. That's a revolution that has already started, and that probably would aid us in terms of our our journey. But like uh, the, the response uh, earlier, uh, it is it is it is. we are also taking a staggered approach towards getting back to functionality right as in we are looking at uh, probably most essential services to be coming into work i spoke about contact centers it's important that we give them the the necessary bandwidth and ip related regulations and department of telecom has restrictions so we we again classify businesses on the basis of whether they need to be physically present like pharma for example needs to be physically present so therefore they need to be coming into premises and that segregation really works and in a staggered manner getting back to normalcy is really helpful and rotations are a way of thing as well it's not any different for banking industry from from an it but uh, again the core banking i don't think anybody comes to the branches anymore uh, it's it's all on devices and that probably would accelerate uh in in the days to come thanks to covid and my take uh, padma kumar banking is not a challenge compared to manufacturing industry because you are not manufacturing anything and when you made all the customers to avoid coming to banks when you made uh, your all cash counters closed and atm machines are open i don't think that's the biggest challenge for you to operate from home the banking operation that's what sir, my take i do not sir, have any ready made solution but maybe uh, future just the thought sir bank. that uh, there is the customer facing operation of the bank and then there is the back office staff operation the customer interface is increasingly becoming digital ever increasingly becoming online i am just looking at the huge numbers of back office staff in banks and the back office operations that they are doing just as you mentioned that for the pharma sector there is a problem in terms of allowing people to work from home i kind of sense that the back office operations of the bank as well would have security concerns in allowing people to work from home that is the basis of my question yeah so i think it's it's an interesting point that you spoke around security on cyber security and that's a very yeah. uh, pertinent point uh, in 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 covid right and uh, my next door neighbor is is a, is a cloud expert he is my one of my childhood friends as well and uh, i see him continuously working from morning like 8 in the morning to late night and late nights because organizations are exploding cloud uh, countries organizations which are averse towards what we call as uh, public cloud uh, there is private cloud and public cloud and people who shied away from your amazon web services and azure platforms are today making inquiries on the platforms because they want to move cloud see historically when you go and ask something uh, say can i do this and the answer that you get is no 
because no is a safe answer, no is a conservative answer, no is a risk free or a risk, less risk answer. You don't have a choice to give that answer anymore today. So uh, your question around back office today, 90% of my back office operations, 90% of my back office operations happen from home. It's happening from Mylapur, from Dachi Boli, I've got folks sitting there as well in Hyderabad. It's happening from some of the homes. I don't have any office premises there. Uh, and, and we have proven that it can be done and it can be done quite securely. So traditional thought processes will get questioned. Cloud would become a new reality. Cyber security will become more relevant. And I, today we are very, very careful and very, very clear on the fact that the skills that will last the test of times are your cyber, your cloud, your containers, your DevOps. Some of those skills are here to stay and more relevant in the days to come. Uh, I hope that answers your question. It's not difficult. Uh, traditional thinking is not going to help us where we want to get. So people will take more risks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, okay, there's another question from uh, Suman Rangabashim. Uh, so the question is, how will performance be measured in the near future? So it could be addressed by any of them. And uh, As, will uh, layoffs become a norm? Will it be lack of performance measure from the organization or upskilling of employees? In fact, Narendran in the beginning, in fact, he has addressed already yes, the Ram. performance. Would you like to take that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in fact, now performance parameters may change. Your KPIs, KRAs may change. It may not be conventional or it may not be the same routine that you have defined your role. Performance uh, measurement could be sometimes a little of subjective to how and what are the changes that you brought into your department or organization and how well you shifted your mindset and your department from the, the crisis to the situation of solutions, that could be, in fact, the factors of the solutions. Of course, no doubt, there, it's, there will be some rules and some departments become obsolete, those who cannot prove that they are relevant to the situation. So this is the time, if you can redefine, I'll connect to the previous question of Mr. Padma Kumar, you say that if in banking, people can develop their expertise of data security, cyber security and all, there are more jobs there, those who work, and you, you are redefining your role, and earlier banks might have not seen this role as so relevant and important. Today, it's very important. I have seen two, three mails in my, my mailbox that cyber security companies are coming in marketing their products and their expertise. So you will have to redefine your role and prove that you are so relevant to the situation. Only KPIs will change. Can I add to this, please, Malini, if it's okay? Absolutely, Vanita, please. I am Looking so forward. thankful we will be doing away with the bell curves and the 360s and uh, the yearly uh -huh. performance. Oh my God, I was like tired of them. You know, I, We've seen so much um, so much on that and we've seen so many fights and people leaving and then, you know blackmailing and taking promotions and you know all sorts of things we've seen a lot of drama around it I'm so happy it's going to be done away with and you know thank God we are going to be looking at it in a you know in a completely fresh way and uh, come out with some um, striking solutions fortunately as an organization last year we moved from uh, the traditional way of you know yearly uh, uh, performance reviews and we moved to reflective one of the applications and uh, so we now have uh, monthly conversations and it's a conversation it's not data it's not uh, numbers it's uh, you know how much nothing nothing it's a conversation and it's feedback that's it. So all of us were trained on the application. All of us were trained on how to coach our team members, especially the people managers. And uh, we, we just record the conversation and we record how our team members are engaged. 
we, oh, of course, we keep in mind that you know whatever projects have been allocated to them, they have completed. We keep in mind how, how the customer is giving feedback to our project managers, and we we you know give a little. I will not say weightage, but we we kind of applaud the team member that you know very nice. We received a good mail from the customer from your client. That's fantastic. So we record our conversations and based on the engagement. We we are uh, you know recognize their effort for the year, so we have monthly conversations around it. And the best part is it's not the people manager's accountability to initiate the conversation. It is the employee's accountability to initiate the conversation with their managers. So I think that's a, a huge shift, and we are just continuing with that. It's working with us very well. At the in, especially in this crisis, it's working very well. Yeah, and I think there is one element of the question which actually spoke about redundancies and job cuts and all that, right? I think uh, the the um, the compassionate articulation of leadership and organizational culture is when you when you go and safeguard and protect your employees during a crisis. So I think most of our organizations uh, have come out and said we're not going to do anything drastic. But let's also be conscious about the fact that this is business, right? I think all of us. Are in um, are in you know there is there is X amount which gets pushed into a business and Y amount needs to come out and that's the whole equation. So uh, I don't think it is. I think it is unfair to be letting organizations maintain the same position and stamina for a longer duration. I think it is our accountability as 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 I think uh, as, as people as employees to. To do what is needed to help the organization uh, strive through. So our our ability to to, to find innovative ways of uh, you know of, of producing more, of doing more, of contributing more when COVID gets over, or even when COVID su sustains, and understanding the organization's position, not letting rumors come through. All of that is extremely critical as HR professionals, learning professionals, and above all employees. Uh, while the organization needs to be empathetic to us, we need to be empathetic towards the organization as well. That, yeah, I think very I well said. Yeah, very well said, Narin. I I completely agree with you. And see, when they're supporting us now, uh, it you know there will be a payback time, and we will have to pay back full and square. No, very well said. Um, so that was very very informative, uh, all of you. Thank you so much for answering that. And uh, Suman, I'm sure it has been answered. Uh, there's another question from one of our participants, Dinesh. So he says, uh, now with virtual training, there is a challenge measurement in the challenge in measurement of the implementation phase of your learning. So what would be your thoughts around this? Uh, anybody, it could be addressed by any any of the speakers. Can can he elaborate a little on implementation phase? So uh, Dinesh, are you? Uh, Dinesh, you might want to unmute to... yourself and. Yeah, hi. Hello. Uh, Dinesh, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can yeah, hear Dinesh. you. We can. All right, wonderful. So um, my question was around the uh, phase three of Kirkpatrick's model, you know, where you actually, uh, where participants actually implement the learning in their day to day work because uh, when we had the traditional method of uh, training and we could actually go on to people's respective workflows and actually have a chat with the manager and the participants to find out how they're measuring that and seeing how that can be tracked. Now, since this is online, there's always a good to have program and there's a must have program. So you're good to have programs. Maybe you can just do with a level one, level two sort of measurement, but your must have programs. It's always nice to have a level three and if possible, a level four measurement. So with regard to having a level three measurement, uh, how would we go about doing it now in this virtual medium? See, I have a slightly philosophical answer to that question. Um, I think uh, uh, I, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been following the Kirkpatrick's model for many, many years, and, and a lot of HR professionals and organizations approach it with a blind eye. Because somebody once told me, Dave Aldrich is a Bible for HR business partner, Kirkpatrick's model is a Bible for 
learning evaluations and we straight jump into it. I think it is important that we take a step back and, and, and evaluate what sort of learning is relevant in the current circumstances. Can you influence, and how, as in terms of, how can you influence culture? How can you impart skills? How can you impart uh, you know, specific aspects of uh, change management or behavior or whatever? Uh, and then you design your programs accordingly. So the traditional definition and concept of programs become relevant and also that's the traditional evaluation model. So uh, I don't think any medium sort of stops you from assessing the effectiveness of what you have done. There are different ways of collecting that feedback, uh, whether it is level one of trying to collect the, the reflections or the reactions of people from uh, at the end of a session, which can continue to be done through online platforms or surveys and all that. And as learning professionals, I have a learning profession in my organization who continues to engage with business, sets up. I think somewhere I, I like the way of Vanita is saying about those case studies, right? Uh, getting to those case studies and understanding those case studies and helping the business articulate how things have changed at the end of a learning program or an intervention that you've done. I think you can continue to do that. So as learning professionals, it's our accountability to reach out to our business leaders, reach out to our our so-called users of our services and ask them those questions. So conversations are key, technology is key. Uh, you may not really be able to get into a workflow and understand evidences of how things have improved, but the reality is that the actual work is still happening in some format or the other. You just need to change the question or change the way in which you ask the question. You would still get the answer. So the reason why I said philosophically is because I think it's not Kirkpatrick's that is relevant anymore. Yeah, the concept is relevant. You need to find out the efficiency or effectiveness of your program, but you should ask it differently. Set up meetings, write your case studies, uh, have some of these conversations, let people dial into conference bridge and share their reflections from multiple ways. Sorry. Yeah. See, uh, can I take this question, Dinesh? Uh... See, oh, in, yes. in fact, yeah, uh, what Dinesh Bainloz is asking is uh, how can you measure the transfer of learning at workplace? Am I right, Dinesh? Absolutely right, yes. Yeah. See, in fact, uh, measuring that level three is nothing to do with the virtual training. Whether it is a virtual training or the classroom training, training is the same, but how you transfer, now you are asking measuring. I feel it's a lot more easier now than the earlier time. Because uh, earlier people used to measure level two by the test, the knowledge uh, test. So you will conduct a pre and post test and you measure their learning. Now, because of this virtual learning and your uh, interaction with the participants, you can even follow interview method. By interviewing, you will understand how much knowledge they gained and how are they going to implement. And you can also immediately bring his reporting officer online and you can also ask him what is the major change that you have observed. And it's a lot more easier for a trainer on the spot to check whether his training or learning has been converted into a behavioral change or not. I feel now this, this will really help. In fact, you've triggered me. I'm trying to, in fact, devise a method how I can measure level three through this. Thank you so much. <laughs> my pleasure. Great. Uh, Dinesh, I'd like to add in my two cents as well. Uh, I like to take Naren's route of being philosophical. I think it's time to dump Kirkpatrick. It's uh, ancient, you know. And uh, uh, I feel, uh, you know, I, I must tell you my personal experience. I was, uh, you know, in love with level three, in love. And I only focused on level three. I never and focused. Also a challenge. <laughs> Yeah. I because I always felt that if we are taking the money out of uh, you know the pockets of our uh, you know our promoters, we need to ensure that uh, the employees you know show the ROI. So I had I used to have like maybe five six hundred projects going on all the time for each and every program. So that at by end of each uh, initiative or intervention, I am able to show the ROI. So it was never level level one and two. It was always level three for me. But having said that, I think um, uh, if, if I look at my own team, 
today I would measure level three. Are they engaged with me? Are they engaged with my clients? Uh, are they happy? Um, are, are they well? Are they safe? Um, are they, you know, logging in for those four or five hours? Uh, do they have any headache? Do they have any fever? Do they have any cold? You know, this would be uh, this would be for my level three for my team. As well as for my clients, uh, the way I would I would interact with them is, you know, uh, are they happy with the way the you know current work system and workflow is going on? Do I need to connect some more people within their organization? Let's say, you know, when we have a project, they are usually one project owner and some three, four people, uh, you know, uh, handholding the entire project or taking over the project. So I check with them. You know, do I need to connect with some more people? Do I need to communicate about, uh, you know, progress status to uh, to your MD, to to your uh, business managers or to your plant managers? Because I I work very closely with pharma, so um, um, that would be my level three. I if if there is a cause of concern, I will immediately pick up the phone and speak to my client and find out what is the issue. How can I help? How can I support? I think. Keeping them with me is my level three at this point of time. I, I, I that you know, as long as my projects are going smoothly and there's no there's no you know client pain, I'm I'm happy. I think that is my ROI and I would have achieved it. So you know, completely, you know, I I think more empathetic, um, a more more uh, well being is how I would like to approach um, level three in this these tough times. Uh, thanks, Manitom. So I hope that answers too. Uh, there's another question from Varsha, one of our participants, and uh, she says so like there are a lot of organizations likely to project great losses. Uh, given that scenario, how about the manpower? How uh, how do they intend to sustain the manpower because of the loss of projected? I think it can be addressed by any any one of the speakers. So Narendran question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, give you the tough one. <laughs> uh, no, it is. It is. It is. I think probably the person who asked the question also understands. Response and it's, it's an innate fear that all of us have, right? As in, uh, uh, how will how will our our organizations, how will the industry survive? I think the problem, the magnitude of the problem, is different for different industries. I, I had a friend of mine doing a survey a few days earlier, and he came back and said times are going to be extremely challenging for airline, for hospitality industry, for hotels, for movies. Uh, so a lot of the things that existed as luxuries and uh, the necessary evils, as I would call it, as would all go through um, a difficult time. And probably what we also realize that's where the crazy money was. That's where the the bulk of uh, the, the the high end expenditures were being made at some point in time. Um, I think uh, what will be the impact on manpower? I think we'll have to wait and see. I think we are preempting solutions, not probably accepting or acknowledging the fact that we are still in the crisis. We are not out of the crisis. Uh, we are we are a few more months, uh, if not, uh, from getting out of this crisis. There is no way escaping COVID unless a vaccine is invented. Um, it, it will continue to emerge in different pockets. I think Tom probably would agree with me as a pharma specialist. Uh, a vaccine is a solution to it. I think what what we could do as as organizations as HR professionals is to, you know, it's it's like a strategy, right? When you play uh, what is called as a, the uh, multiple different games, I think uh, my son would probably be able to relate to it. And he speaks about playing the strategy where you need to duck, where you need to to get out and shoot and where you need to. So I think we all need to play that strategy at this point of time. And organizations with stable, capable leadership will play that strategy. Will there be casualties? There will be casualties. You would lose a life. You would lose two lives. But if you are a smart player, if you play your game well, at the end of it, you will emerge with those. Uh, so uh, it is too, too early to say what sort of an impact will it have on jobs. 
uh, in certain industries it will in certain industries the impact will be very very less every decision that we take today as an organization as an hr professional as a leader is going to have an impact on the future of our my call out my call out is let's be responsible let's take the right decisions let's take the calculated risks and and and, and ensure that we survive we survive this together because one industry uh, emerges victorious will help two other industries stand on its feet so i think we are doing it not just for ourselves but for the larger economy around us as well so uh, it's a it's a it's not a straight answer but i think i have probably played the same game that i was talking about yeah i agree narin can i take this ram before you um um I, it reminds me of the australian bushfires uh if you followed them through because i'm an environmentalist and uh, very closely you know involved with uh, many many environmental related projects so uh, australian bushfires saw rats saw rats for many months together and uh, australia by itself suffered but you will not believe this though it was uh, winter time and slowly moving into the summer time it suddenly started raining and uh, the bushfires have stopped and out of the rumble uh, we have started seeing green sprouting back animals coming back and flowers you know to begin flowering again so i think like somebody has written i think padma kumar has written you know we've seen world wars we've seen recessions we've seen many such uh, uh, you know uh, debacles happen in this in our universe uh, we've survived it we've come back and we i think we have pretty strong people you know yes like, like narain said uh, uh, you know um, already in europe the entire uh, clothing and garment industry is slowly going to uh, uh, you know file for bankruptcy insolvency uh, the entire furniture industry because we are very closely associated to them as an organization entire clothing and furniture industry design industry is going to uh, you know file for bankruptcy but something else will emerge yes they will be like you know casualty and i'm repeating the same thing we need to accept that fact but uh, you know think think big th re, you know re reinnovate yourself you know rework on what you currently have what you don't have and i think you will bounce back i i believe that what goes down has to come up i i really believe that uh with so much of positivity around i'm sure we're going to overcome this very soon this crisis very soon and it it was very insightful for the participants and uh, very positive the entire order is positive so i'm sure this is going to trickle down everywhere uh and this we have uh, further questions from the other participants so uh, i don't see any any further questions here so uh, suma do you want to take over Uh, Sabina, would you like to take over, please? Sure. Mali, uh, so, uh, before we close, I just want to make one more point. I think it's about boundaries. Yes, sir. About the boundaries that we have drawn within HR today, and I keep telling this to my my, my larger team, saying uh, today uh, the world expects, or our employees expect, a lot from HR, and HR is not defined as learning professionals. HR business partners, recruitment, payroll. I think they they look at us as leadership. They look at us. So I I had an analogy some time back saying that an HR person is like Google Maps. They're looking at us for directions. They're looking at us for those pit stops. They're looking at us for uh, you know some of those clarity, right? So I think the boundaries that exist in HR do not exist. And I've had circumstances of learning folks saying, "Oh, I'm a learning professional. This is not something which I am familiar with." or an hrbp saying that you know what this is a learning area let me send you there so i think it becomes a collective accountability of us to to kill our target operating models to kill our boundaries or and 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 create value for for the entire organization so i think the mentality should be or should not be that i am a learning person so this is what i would do i think to start considering ourselves as as hr and also as extension of leadership uh in, in in organizations in the society and start responding to asks so which is critical 
uh, as a learning professional probably i would like to conclude with my remarks saying that a couple of things that uh, do we ignore we need to discuss about them right? uh, for example most of the learnings in fact as social learning take a major part and around 75% of learning will happen social learning uh, maybe during the coffee breaks and when you meet them in a cafeteria a very informal meetings and their uh, the learning exchange will happen maximum probably we need to replace i do not know in future we will come up with some solution to replace this social learning then now that people must be missing second thing is a cabin fever probably because of this social distance and all and isolation people will be away from the workplace and colleagues and all except meeting on the webinars or so and you feel at home for some time it is a joy and you are spending with the family i know over a period of time slowly people start thinking about their insecurities about their missing people and this is what is the psychological issues also will emerge people probably the learning professionals and hr professionals need to address that the the trust and the safety and security giving them that assurance is also very important this has to be there and employees uh, they that those are the jobs that can't be digitized people may uh, need to redefine them and they need you need to work probably you need to upskill yourself so that uh, your job role is still relevant and uh, important in, in learning kinesthetic learning may be missing it Uh, and vak in fact visually auditory uh, people may enjoy it but kinesthetic is will have a challenge i do not know in future technology may also give that ar vr like and kinesthetic learning also these learners will not be ignored here these are all the concerns that i have probably our technology will come up with the solutions very soon so i thought just i need to bring it to the notice of all the families um um Thank you so much, Ram. Thanks, Narin. I like to add in my, you know, we little bit. Uh, I think while we are facing these difficulties and uh, we are also simultaneously, you know, bouncing back and thinking and acting, you know, you know, in a new fashion, you know, completely changing our way of, uh, uh, you know, thinking and perspectives. So while we are doing that. i think there's a huge opportunity that i am seeing uh, for our learning professions and i like to leave that behind you know you me and uh, narain malni this entire team sitting here today is uh, passing it's the new millennia which is uh, you know forthcoming and you know slowly going to come up and who is this new millennia i think it's time we look at them um they, we've been looking at them for a while now but then you know in this new situation we look at them again um they they are the ones who want you know instant gratification they are worried how come the world has not been able to solve this issue it's almost four weeks you know it's almost three months so uh you know they are the ones who are not stable like you and me you know we were very quickly as a family also we noticed as a family within one week we were out of it you know fear panic really didn't affect us but uh, i I've, i've been speaking and interacting with some children in my complex and my community and i see they they are they are like restless restless so i think as learning professionals you know um, this is a great opportunity uh, if you can come out with certain uh, uh, learning programs and some interactions for them so that one they become resilient they become mentally stable they are engaged uh, you know and uh, uh, they are, they, are uh, they 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 should survive this i feel they are lateral entries into this world you know they got it all ready made you and i have always struggled to create what is there in front of us today you know we we bought our own houses we educated ourselves all of that but our children have you know just entered laterally i feel so i think we really need to focus because they've got it all you know everything is provided to them i think we really need to focus over there and um, i think our learning professionals our freelancers have a huge opportunity lying there so i thought uh, i'll just leave that there and i audience thank you uh that's that's very welcoming go <laughs> manita uh, so 
Mal, yes, Termal, please. Yes, Termal, please. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Ram Jaladurgam, Vanita, and uh, Narendra. Fantastic show. I think you know, a lot of insight. I really enjoyed thoroughly listening to three of you. Uh, with reference to Ram, uh, Ram, are you able to listen to me? Mr. Ram. Your, yes, your I am able to listen. I am able to follow you. Yeah, with reference to you know kinesthetic experience during trainings, which yeah. you have mentioned a while ago. Uh, if you really see these you know tools which you are operating, either it's Microsoft or even Zoom, there are breakout rooms. There are different channels which we can make them. When we really do the breakout rooms and assign the rooms to participants, and when they go back and discuss, and there's a lot of kinesthetic experience which comes in because there are select few, you know, maybe four or five people in a group. There are multiple groups which are created. Give, a, give them a kind of a topic and agenda. They discuss in their you know, specific rooms and come back to the main, main, main channel and then you know, they start presenting them. So while they're put into those breakout rooms, they experience a lot of you know, familiarity, a lot of interface between four or five people who can sit up and discuss. So I think I found that you know, this kinesthetic factor is addressed in that you know, activity. I, that's what I just wanted to bring to your notice. Thirmal. This yes, kinesthetic I was speaking about with reference to the social distance. You will not have a second participant. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, in a platform like this, I'll, re I'll paraphrase myself again. Instead of having a monologue, one too many monologues, like you know, if you are as a trainer or as a faculty or a speaker, if it's just one-way traffic, then there is a kind of a boredom there. So particularly if you can bring in this participative approach, engaging approach, uh, perhaps you know that's one way of engaging the participants and therefore there is a space and room for them to discuss to deliberate and come back and present so that actually brings in a kind of a sense of participation and sense of engagement there so there is some amount of kinesthetic element in that what i'm going to say is that thank you so much thirmal thanks for my me. pleasure Tom. my pleasure Thanks, Thirumul, uh, for the inputs for people who are not very familiar with the uh, breakout areas in the Zoom call or in any of the virtual platforms. So, uh, so that's that's going to be a learning for the other facilitators as well who might want to go and explore a bit on that. Um, yes, over to you, Sabina, unless we have any further questions. Thank you, Malini. Um, I think I should thank everybody for coming online. Ram, thank you so much. Vanita, thank you so much. And Narain, I see him off camera, but thank you, Narain, if you're still on the call. Um, I think what I liked about this entire discussion was um, it was it came out as a very open and an honest discussion. And I'm happy that you shared your apprehensions, your thoughts. You um, and all three of you come from like one of you comes from LND. We've got um, Narain from the HR and Vanita from the operations side. So we've got a good uh, discussion going on there from all perspectives, all the three perspectives. And I see a lot of. Um, avenues have kind of opened up and I like what Narain also said that we need to think of solutions. So while we also wanted to think of uh, prospective solutions for the HR and learning community, I think what's come out strong is that we need to um, step up and become the solution providers for um, the um, community, the industry as a whole. So thank you for your time and your insights and we shall continue to have this conversation going. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, Sabina, for this Pleasure. opportunity. Thank you. Loved working with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ram. Thank you, Thanks, speakers. Marine. Thanks, Vanita. Narendra, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.